Hey everybody, so today is very exciting because I'm doing something that I've never done before. I am going to the theater and I'm gonna be watching two movies back to back, so a double feature. And this is because I have today off of work and these are two movies that I've been wanting to see for quite a while. So I've heard really good things about both. I'm just really pumped to finally be able to see them in theaters, even though one of them was just released, but I feel like I've been waiting a long time for it. So the first one is Pearl, and my expectations for Pearl are uh, more of Mia Goth being just an absolute badass and some cool connections to X. I'm excited to see how they kind of tie the two movies together. Um, yeah, and just some good slasher elements tied in with a really tight character story. So I'm very excited for that. And the second film is Barbarian. And my expectations for that, I don't really have any. Um, I have tried to avoid as many spoilers as possible. I basically have only watched the trailer, which from what I've heard, didn't really give away many spoilers. So that's good. Um, and the only thing that I'm expecting is to expect the unexpected, because <laughs> uh, I've heard it's just such a wild film uh, and it takes a lot of twists and turns. So um, the order in which I'm watching them, I did a poll on Instagram to ask people who have seen both what they would suggest. My gut feeling said that I should watch Pearl first and end with Barbarian because Barbarian sounds so wild. And that is what y'all on Instagram voted for. So I'm gonna go see Pearl first and then Barbarian after that. So let's go ahead and go to the theater. Okay, so I just got back from the theater and Right now, I'm just going to kind of give my overall thoughts about each movie, spoiler-free, of course, and then I'm going to go into deeper reviews on each film. So, uh, starting with Pearl, I was not as into it as I was X. It's kind of hard not to just automatically compare those two films. I thought stylistically it was beautiful, the score, it looked gorgeous, all of the stylization of it was great. Um, as far as it being, you know, kind of like an impressive or, I don't know if I want to say like mind-blowing story, because X wasn't necessarily mind-blowing, but um, Pearl was just more understated, I guess, and a lot less horror than I thought we were going to get. So... Yeah, um, I don't know. I, I definitely think that I'm still excited for Maxine, the third installment in the franchise that we are getting. I'm not sure when, but uh, yeah, uh, so that's how I felt about Pearl um, and Barbarian. <laughs> um, I guess it definitely lived up to the hype as far as everyone's saying that you're not going to expect where it goes. Um but I just don't know how I feel about where it went is the thing. Again, another very, uh, you know, stylistically good movie, um, like the score of this one as well, the way it was shot, the acting, all of that. But again, it comes down to the story. So yeah, <laughs> I'm going to elaborate more on that in the individual reviews. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay, so today is a new day. I've had some time to sit with each of these movies and really think about how I felt about them. So now we're going to go ahead and get into the more in-depth reviews of each film. And we're going to start with Pearl. We're going to go in order of how I watched them. So if you want to skip ahead to the Barbarian review, I'm going to go ahead and add chapters to this video. So you can go down in the description and click on the time link for that. Say you maybe haven't watched Pearl yet and you just want to skip ahead to the Barbarian review. So that will be there for you. So we're going to go ahead and get into what I thought about Pearl. And these are both going to be spoiler filled reviews. So if you want to avoid those, then, um, you know, watch them and then come back to this video and check out the review after that. So you have been warned there will be spoilers in both reviews. Um, so starting out with Pearl, uh, I just have to say um, that I think Ty West did a really good job with this one again, like X. Um, it is a little bit like X for me in that 
uh, the more I sit with it, the more I like it. So um, when I came out of the theater, I knew that overall I enjoyed it, but there were some things I was a little bit iffy on. And now that I've had some more time to sit and kind of marinate with it, uh, I do think I came out on the other end really enjoying it. Um, it just, uh, it was a little bit different uh, than my expectations that I had for it, which I know you can't hold a movie to your expectations. It's impossible. They'll almost never be exactly what you think they're going to be. Uh, so I'll get into a little bit more about uh, my expectations a little bit later in this review. But uh, I just have to say that the score was phenomenal. I really enjoyed the music in this film. I think it set the tone really well for the time period, um, as well as the way it was shot. I think Ty West just does such a good job at uh, framing a shot, having these really interesting visuals that keep us really engaged. It's very artistic and artful. So uh, the same as X in that regard, I thought that it was just a beautifully shot film and I really enjoyed the aesthetics of it. Ty West just really has a knack for creating some really memorable imagery, uh, especially for me. I mean, there were a lot of things in this movie that stood out visually, but I think that the Pearl and Scarecrow scene is one of those that will be unforgettable. And the fact that this movie, according to Wikipedia, this movie only cost a million dollars to make, I just think that that is so unbelievable because it looks so good. Um, so really kudos to everybody involved in the filmmaking process of this movie. Um, and uh, if we want to go ahead and touch on the acting a little bit, I think that all of the acting was phenomenal. I think everybody played their parts perfectly. Uh, there was not a weak performance in the bunch uh, that stood out to me, at least. So uh, obviously, especially Mia Goth did an incredible job. She just has a real grasp on who the character of Pearl is supposed to be. And it was the same way with her uh, being Maxine in X. And I think that she brought a very uh, different character to this film. Obviously, she is the same actress, but she's playing two different roles. So I really appreciated how different Pearl feels from Maxine. Um, and obviously she helped write the part too. Uh, she helped write this movie, which uh, I think is so cool. Uh, so she was really involved in the whole creative process of this film with Ty West. And I think that you can really see that in her performance. I think you can see that she was just having a blast with this role. So a lot of people have been comparing Pearl to uh, The Wizard of Oz, kind of calling it a darker, more twisted Wizard of Oz. And I do think that I have to agree with that. Um, I mean, you have the pastoral farm scenes, which are very reminiscent of the Wizard of Oz. And of course, things like the scarecrow um, and even Pearl's outfit with the overalls in the blue shirt is kind of sort of reminiscent of Dorothy's outfit. So I don't know if that was necessarily intentional, but I definitely got those vibes as well. Um, I do think it's kind of like Pearl is is the characters of Dorothy and the wizard and the Wicked Witch kind of all rolled up into one. She has facets of each of their personalities. So obviously the wide-eyed optimism of Dorothy, the ambition of Dorothy, wanting a better life or wanting something different. You have the wizard who is pretending to be something that he's not. Um, he's trying to fool everyone into thinking he's this great person when in reality, uh, he's maybe just a mediocre person, uh, which is what we kind of come to find out about Pearl throughout the film. And then uh, towards the end of the film, she kind of turns into the Wicked Witch, which is where she kind of just enacts this revenge on these people in her life. So I thought that that was kind of interesting how uh, she parallels all three of those roles. Um, and there might be some other parallels too that I just didn't catch on a first viewing. So if anybody uh, has any other uh, kind of things that are similar to The Wizard of Oz that you want to leave in the comments below. I'd love to know. Also, just your general thoughts on this movie as well. Please let me know in the comments. Oh, I will say, in addition to The Wizard of Oz uh, kind of discourse of this movie, um, the fact that Pearl's mother uh, is saying that she just needs to be happy with what she has to not be wishing for her life to be different. She should just be happy with what she has. And that is definitely the same thing as Dorothy wishing for someplace over the rainbow. And then at the end of the film, coming to terms with 
there's no place like home. So I thought that that was definitely another through line between those two movies. So there's definitely a lot of symbolism in this film, and I'm sure I did not catch all of it again on a first watch, but one that really stuck out to me was the inclusion of the um, roasted whole pig that uh, Pearl's mother-in-law brings to the farm, and uh, her mother thinks that it's an act of charity and she will not accept it. She's not looking for handouts, so um, the pig remains on their doorstep for the duration of the film, and we see shots of it uh, just getting more and more rotten and full of maggots, and I think that that definitely symbolizes Pearl's mental state in this movie because it is just slowly deteriorating over the film, and then by the end of it, she takes that pig and puts it on the table in this really uh, gross perversion of a family dinner. Um, and again, like I said, guys, spoilers. <laughs> so um, we've got, you know, her mother and father that she's killed at this dinner table as well. And she's sitting there and, you know, just having this really weird, almost Texas Chainsaw Massacre-esque dinner. Uh, so yeah, I think that the pig definitely symbolizes her and uh, her mental state just deteriorating throughout the film. So I thought that that was a really nice, if not gross, touch <laughs> on Ty West's part. So uh, going back to the acting a little bit, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about uh, Mia's performance and just how she handles certain scenes in this film. I think it's really incredible uh, how she can do her monologue scene um, towards the end of the film when she's talking to her sister-in-law. Uh, she is pretending like her sister-in-law is her husband, Howard, who we did meet in X, and we see him very briefly in this film, um, but she is talking to her sister-in-law as if she is Howard, and she's just kind of pouring her heart out with everything she's been feeling, and we get this steady shot on her face for almost the whole entire monologue. It's so impressive that Mia Goth could do that all in one take and um, just have it come across as being this phenomenal moment of acting. Uh, it was a little bit funny in my uh, theater. There was someone who had fallen asleep during this scene. I don't know if it was just because there was a lack of acting action happening, um, but they fell asleep and they were actively snoring uh, while the movie was going and people around me were starting to giggle at it. And it was just kind of funny because I think that sort of symbolized the people that will watch this movie and find scenes like this kind of boring and be like, where's the action? Where's the horror? What's going on? Um, so I thought that was a little bit amusing, but I was very intrigued by that scene. And again, I think that Mia just did a fantastic job pulling it off. And we can even talk about the very end, the shot where uh, it's just her manically smiling after Howard gets home and discovers what's happened. He sees all the um, carnage and the dead bodies and the rotting pig, and he's kind of in shock and she is just grinning and trying to hold back tears at the same time. And you can just see in her face that she's like, I really hope that he's cool with this and that he'll stay with me. And obviously we know because of X, he does. <laughs> so that shot lasts forever and the credits roll over her face and she just keeps holding it. So again, bravo to Mia. I mean, she's just, she's fantastic. And she's just really not afraid to look uh, crazy or gross. Uh, it makes me think of the scene where she loses the dance audition. She does not get picked. And we see her outside afterwards just sobbing with her entire body, uh, her head's in her hands. And then when she puts her face up, you see, I mean, snot is just pouring out of her nose and there's spit on her chin. And I just really appreciate that Mia is not afraid to go there. Like she was all in, <laughs> she was willing to go the extra mile for this character. And I just love that. And speaking of the kills, uh, you know, they were few and kind of far between, but they were all pretty effective and they all really made sense within the context of what was going on in the narrative. Um, and they were relatively brutal as well. Um, so I think I was kind of expecting there to be a lot more carnage. And that can kind of bring me into my points that I um, had a little bit of problems with the film. And this is just on my end, this is just my personal opinion, but uh, it just didn't quite feel very horror to me. I don't know. It felt a lot more like a drama that had some horror elements to it. And based off of what we saw in X, I was kind of expecting Pearl to be sort of an all-out gore fest. And I think I just got my hopes up a little bit too high on that end.
And so that's really on me and my expectations. So the fact that the movie didn't meet that isn't the movie's fault. It's definitely on me, but I don't know. I just kind of felt like I wanted a little bit more of a horror feel to it, but I still, I really like how it turned out. And it's definitely a movie that I would be absolutely open to watching again. I think that there's a lot that you can get out of it. And it definitely seems like it would reward subsequent subsequent rewatches. <laughs> Another thing I was a little disappointed by was the fact that in X, it seemed like it was pretty well established that canonically Pearl is bisexual. Um, and we didn't really get any hints at that whatsoever in Pearl. Uh, so that was something I was a little bit bummed by because I thought that they were going to kind of go more in depth with Pearl's sexuality. And we kind of saw her sexual awakening, I guess you could call it throughout the film, but um, it was really just focused on men. So uh, yeah, I don't know. That was something that I kind of wish that Ty West had infused a little bit more into the story of Pearl. But yeah, overall, I did enjoy Pearl, and I think that it is a really good companion piece to X, and I'm just really excited to see where this franchise goes. I'm excited to see Maxine, and that's one that I will definitely be seeing in theaters when it comes out. So in case you skipped the Pearl review to come straight to the Barbarian review, just a reminder that there are going to be spoilers for this movie, so you have been warned. So. So uh, I think it's kind of funny that both Pearl and Barbarian were exactly 102 minutes. So they had the exact same runtime. And I do think even despite watching Pearl first, that that film felt a little bit longer than Barbarian. Um, neither of them drug by any means, but I think that Pearl just had some slower paced moments. So both uh, were pretty easy watches though, I will say. There wasn't really a point where I was like wanting to check my phone to see what time it was or anything like that. So I uh, just wanted to say at the top of this review that there is a trigger warning for mention of sexual assault and rape. So if that is something you are not comfortable with watching, then please feel free to skip this review. Um, so yeah, without further ado, ado um, we are going to talk about Barbarian. And uh, this is a film that I had not really heard much about. Like I told you, I went in pretty blind, which is the ideal way to watch this film. If there's any way that you can avoid spoilers, I would highly suggest going in without knowing anything about it. So off the top, I wanted to say that like Pearl, I was really impressed by both the score and the cinematography of this film. Uh, I believe it is the director, Zach Kreger's first feature length debut film. So uh, please correct me if I'm wrong about that. Wrong, 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 wrong. Wrong, 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 wrong. I thought that he really had a great eye. He had a real feel for transitions in this film. I think that there were some really cool ways that he had the camera move and certain shots and things like that. So that I was all very impressed by. And he really knew the timing of when to cut from one scene to another. There are several abrupt scene changes that happen in this movie. And I really think that those kept you on your toes and uh, kept you engaged with the story because you were just wondering like, wait, we were just here and now we're here. What's going on? How does this fit into the overall narrative? So I thought that that was really, really effective on the director's part. So whereas Pearl was a little light on the horror elements, I would say Barbarian is absolutely 100% a horror film. There is no doubt about that. They really did a great job of injecting suspense and dread and terror into this film, which I really appreciated. Uh, the whole time I was just on the edge of my seat wondering what was gonna happen next. And a lot of that had to do with the structure of the story, but I also think just the way that the settings were shot were really effective. That whole basement uh, going down those creepy stairs into all of those little rooms. I don't know if you could even call them rooms. I mean, it's a dungeon basically. So I thought that the way that those were shot were really effective and super scary. Also just these little moments that were really well done and were really scary and just kind of added to the overall feel of the film. I would say one of those being when the main character Tess is coming back from, I believe it's her job interview and she is walking into the house and you just see 
really far off in the distance, there is a figure that is sprinting towards her and you have no idea who it is or what's happening. And you're just terrified for her. Uh, so I thought that that scene was really well done. I mean, that's just one example, of course. And I'm just going to leave you guys with three words. And if you've seen this movie, you will know <laughs> that baby bottle just, ugh. Shivers. <laughs> so yeah, like I said, the way that this movie plays as a horror movie is super well done. And I do appreciate the injection of comedy into this movie as well. There are some really funny moments and really funny lines that characters deliver. Um, a lot of them coming from Justin Long's character, uh, which I love Justin Long and I love that he is continuing to be in horror films. I hope that he just keeps doing that because he is so good and he really brings this element of levity and humor, uh, as well as the complexity to his character. There are some really heavy moments that he brings as well. So I just, I really love Justin Long. <laughs> I also thought that the acting in Barbarian was really good. Everybody did a fantastic job. Like I said, Justin Long was amazing. And the actress who played Tess, I'm so sorry, I should have looked this up before, but um, yeah, I had never seen her in anything before, but she did a really good job too. Yeah, just everybody really sold their parts and was really, just putting their all into their roles. So essentially, uh, the main takeaway I had from Barbarian was men do terrible things. And, you know, I just have to say, what's new? <laughs> For all you not all men people, you can just go ahead and uh, let the door hit you on the way out. <laughs> so the film touches on basically three types of predatory men or the way that men can be predatory towards women. Uh, so the first one being the character of Frank, who is the old man. We see him in the 80s flashback. And he's the one in the bunker in the basement where he is just, I guess, bedridden. Um, so he, his character, is a straight up kidnapper, murderer, rapist, um, overall just terrible human being. He's unabashedly evil and he just does what he does because he likes it and he doesn't care. He doesn't care about the impact he has on other people's lives. Um, and that he's just an awful human, basically. And he's the man who gets away with it. He does this for years and years, and he never gets caught, and he never has to face the consequences of his actions. So um, he is one kind of predatory man. The second is represented by AJ, which is Justin Long's character, who is an actor who um, gets called out by, I believe it's a fellow actor, for sexual misconduct. Um, I don't know if it was on the set or it's kind of unclear what happens, but it's, you know, with one of his coworkers, basically. Um, so he represents the kind of man who he thinks he's a good guy, you know? He thinks that he really hasn't done anything wrong. Sure, maybe he's made some mistakes. Maybe some things were taken out of context or taken the wrong way by other people. He's the kind of guy who will say he's sorry and is baffled and shocked when it's called to his attention that he did something wrong and he is just a manipulator and a coercer. Uh, so, I mean, in the wake of the Me Too movement, it seems very, very prescient, his type of character. So um, that is the second kind of predatory man in this movie. And the third, um, I have to talk about Keith, even though he is not a bad person from what we see in the film. He seems like a perfectly lovely human who just unfortunately gets brutally murdered. But I do have to talk about him because he represents the potential predator, the uh, kind of unseen threat, if you will. So uh, Tess's character, when she gets to the Airbnb and it's double booked and he is there, she is very wary to stay there, uh, understandably so, because of the threat that Keith could pose to her. You know, if he wanted to, he could potentially assault her and rape her, you know, and do terrible things while she's in this house. She doesn't know him. Um, and even after she does get to know him a little bit, still doesn't mean that he's not capable of that. So um, I think it's really interesting that we kind of have these three archetypes of male characters that represent the predatory nature that men can have 
um, against women and men too, uh, all genders really. Um, but this one really focused on, you know, our protagonist is a woman. So yeah, I thought that that was really interesting and how their storylines were all woven together and the overarching story connected them. I thought that that was really cool. Uh, so yeah, I, I did really appreciate that concept of the film. So now we have to get to my main gripe with this movie and I'm still kind of working through how I feel about it, but I'll just go ahead and kind of get it out here. So um, my main problem was with the monster. Uh, it didn't have anything to do with the way the monster looked. I thought that it was really scary <laughs> um, and really creepy, but the implications, I guess, is what I had more of an issue with. Um, the implications that, so essentially this monster is a product of years and years of ancestral rape, right? So she is this inbred, I don't know if she's supernatural. She seems like she is. I thought that she was, but the explanation in the film made it seem like she wasn't. So I'm not really sure about that. But um, either way, she is uh, basically a um, disabled victim. And just having her be the villain of the film, I don't know. I just don't know how I feel about that. I mean, you know, she is injected with some humanity for sure. And I did appreciate that part. We see she really just wants a baby to mother. She wants to care for something. Um, it's the way she goes about it that is incredibly, uh, you know, problematic. But uh, I just don't know. I don't know how that comes off. It just kind of seems like we might be past the point of making inbred people demons or villains in movies. I don't know. And on top of that, the fact that she was played by a man. So I know there's definitely a big history of having men play female villain characters in horror movies. I mean, you look at Aunt Zelda from Pet Cemetery or the Widow Ghost in Insidious, just to name a few. I mean, there are a ton. So um, it's definitely a part of the history of horror. But I think that they do that because they want this female character to look even more scary and creepy and othered. So having a man play this female character, I think they think it comes off that way. And the thing for me is I just don't know how uh, that comes off, you know, in regards to trans people. So trans women, especially. Um, and I am not trans, but I, and this is something that I need to look more into and research more and see what the trans community has said about characters like this. But it just seems a little bit um, ill-advised to have a character like that be the villain and have the fact that it's a man playing a woman make it be the uncanny and creepy factor, if that makes sense. So, um yeah, I don't know. That's just how I felt about it. That's that's what I came out of the movie thinking. So if you have thoughts on that, please let me know. But please be respectful in the comments, everyone. Um, but yeah, I just think it would have been cool to see a woman rock that role too. Uh, I digress. Uh, talking about the end of the film, I think I was pretty satisfied with how it ended. I was definitely glad that Tess survived. Uh, and just overall, I did like it. I had a really fun time with it. There were just those few things that I was a little bit unsure about, but uh, I do wonder how this movie would reward rewatches if you know the twists and turns, kind of how it plays when you watch it again. So I am excited to rewatch it when it comes to streaming and physical media. Um, yeah, so let me know too what you thought about the twists, if you saw any of it coming or if you were as shocked as I was at the way the story went. So, so those are my reviews for Pearl and Barbarian. Um, you can't really compare the two. They are so different and uh, they're not really comparable, but I guess if I had to pick a favorite between the two, I would have to say Barbarian, just because I had a really fun time with it. It was really unexpected, um, but it was it was pretty close, I would say, between the two movies. The double feature experience was really fun, so I'm really glad that I did it that way. So uh, yeah, if you have seen both or one of these movies, let me know in the comments what you thought about them. I would love to know your opinions. And if you liked this video, please hit that thumbs up button and consider subscribing to my channel. So yeah, um, I kind of uh, like this combo of vlog and review, uh, kind of having both in one video.
video. So if you like that too, please let me know. And yeah, that is going to be it for today. Thank you everyone so much for watching. I really appreciate it. I hope you all have a fantastic day and we'll talk horror next time. Yeah.